chapter 2. And uh, don't forget now, we're going to meet here Saturday morning at 9.30. We need everybody to take these things out of here with you tonight. We'll have some more Saturday morning if we need them. Ever bus to hit about 100 doors, and uh, we're excited about that and looking for a great time. Uh, every bus route. And then all you folks that, that's not even in the bus ministry, take some of these and give them to your friends at work. Take some to your neighbor and say, look here, we're going to have some big day Sunday at church. Uh, come on, and the, I'm going to preach about the end times and how close we are to coming to the Lord. And I'm asking you to pray the Holy Spirit would take it and use it for his glory. Judges, uh, we, we, I'm just going to hit the high spots of chapter 2 again, and then we're going to look at chapter 3 uh, tonight, okay? So uh, we'll, um, we'll look here. I think we got to about verse 14. Actually, I read on down there a little bit, but it talked about Joshua dying in verse 8 of chapter 2. It actually happened in Joshua. And here you see it again. The book of Judges over and over and over emphasizes this truth. They go up, they get backslid, they fall. So when they fall, they cry out to the Lord. He helps them, gets them back up, and then they get backslid and fall again. And then they cry on the Lord. He helps them up. He blesses them. Then they forget his blessings and get backslid and fall again. Does that sound familiar? Uh, you ever seen that movie before? Uh, if you're a Christian, you know exactly what that's talking about. That's a picture of the Christian life. The Christian life is a series of ups and downs, just like you drive from here to the mountains up yonder. You're going up, you're going down. You're going up, and you're going down. You're going real good for a while, and you think you got it, bam! There you'll, you'll fall and bust your nose. Now, I, I can say that the, the older you get, I've noticed as I've got older, it levels out a little bit. It's not as up and down as it was when I was young. So you got that to look forward to. Thank God uh, you, 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 uh, you, you learn some things over life that helps you level out. You know, when you're young, you're awful dumb, awful dumb. And some people never do learn. That's really sad when you meet somebody that's old and still ain't learned a lesson. But the older you get, the more lessons you learn that makes you more conservative. And you know why young people so wild? Because they ain't got no sense. But if they get their nose bloodied enough times, they'll learn you don't mess around like that. And if you, if you see a man that's 40 years old or 45, or 50, and he's still out here partying and stuff, that's one dumb individual. Because he still ain't learned his lesson. You need to learn your lesson, y'all. You can't mess around and disobey God and everything goes smooth in your life. The book of Judges teaches that. So let's look at verse number, look at verse 13. And they forsook the Lord. There they go again. And served Baal and Ashtaroth. We talked about them two gods last week. The male god Baal, the female god Ashtaroth. Verse 14. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies. They could no longer stand for their enemies. Now how plain does it have to get? You disobey God, he lets your enemies take over you. He does the same thing to the United States. He does the same thing to individuals. He'll do the same thing to churches. He'll do the same thing to you. If you, if you, the anger of the Lord was hot against them. Man, I'd hate for, we well, don't want God getting mad at you. You don't want that. You don't want that. You don't want God getting angry with you. You say, well, Brother Danny, we're saved by grace. This ain't God. Nothing to do with that. We're not talking about your, your uh, standing in Christ. We're talking about your state on a day-to-day -day basis. You don't want the Lord getting angry with you. He'll sell you into the hands of the spoilers. Buddy, I, I'm a firm believer if you're a Christian and you get out here and mess around and do something you shouldn't do, the Lord will smack you around real good. He corrects his children. Just like any good parent, <laughs> excuse me, a parent that don't correct their child is not a good parent. And the Lord is a mighty good parent. Verse number 15, Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them. See, everything they'd done, God just worked against them. You don't want that. And the Lord had swore to them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, verse 16, he is merciful, raised them up judges, which delivered them. Verse 17, yet they would not hearken, but went a whoring after other gods. Verse 17, notice the word whoring. 
You know what God, when, when God's people go and worship another God, he, he compares them to a whore cheating on her husband. That's what he compares them to because he's, he's our first love and he's our one that we serve. And if you you cheating on your husband, saying that when, when you're out here doing stuff that the devil wants you to do, you're just the same as a wife that's, that's running around on her husband. Same thing. Go a whoring after other gods. He turned them quickly out of the way. Verse 18, the Lord raised them up judges. And uh, verse 19, as soon as the judge was dead, they corrupted themselves again. Verse 20, the anger of the Lord was hot against them because uh, they sinned. And verse 21, he said, I will not drive them out no more. And on and on and on and on, stubbornly. Verse 23, Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither deliver he into the hand of Joshua. Now notice what he done. Them nations that was in there, the Jebusites and the Hittites and the Canaanites and all them people that I talked about last week, he told them, he said, drive them out, drive them out, drive them out. And he said, they left them in, left them in, left them in. And the Lord said, all right, I'll leave them in. And that's where they got false doctrine, worshiping other gods, diseases. See, them people had all kinds of sexual diseases, especially, especially. And he said, get it out, get rid of it. If you don't, they'll corrupt you. And that's exactly what happened. Now, let me tell you something, people. If you don't drive that sin out of your life, it'll corrupt you. It'll corrupt you. No sin stays little. Sin grows. It's like cancer of the soul. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. All right? Verse number three, or chapter three. Chapter three. I, I want to hurry and get to this chapter tonight quickly. Now, these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan only that the generation of the children of Israel might know to teach them war at the least such as before knew nothing of this new generation had come up. Here's who he wanted to drive out, verse 3. The lords of the <laughs> Philistines, the Canaanites, the Sidonians, the Hivites that dwelt in Lebanon from Mount Baal-Hermon unto the entering end of Hamath. And they were, they were to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their father by the hand of Moses. God left them people there to prove Israel to see if they'd obey him or not. You know what the Lord will do? The Lord will let you go through some temptation or some really wicked something tempt you to prove you, to see what you're made out of. You say, well, don't he already know? Yeah, he does. But he wants you to know and you to realize it. So he lets you go through. The and the children of Israel, verse dwelled among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Verse 6, And they took their daughters to be their wives. There goes the problem. Uh, you bring a lot of hardship on yourself by refusing to put away the strange gods out of your life. Couldn't we all say here tonight, all of us adults, that we've got a lot of hardships in our life because of dumb things we done when we was young or something we should have done we, we refused to do. Amen? Yes, sir. Some of us, some of you, some of the people in here, you're paying for it right now of stuff you done when you was in your teens and your 20s. I know boys right now uh, that have arthritis. I know guys right now in their 50s that can hardly stand up straight. It's called as wild as a buck when they was 18, 19, 20. And they thought that Superman could go out and stay out all night and party and get drunk and do all, and, it, and it wouldn't hurt them. And it does hurt you. It comes back on you. All that stuff comes back on you. It comes, the Bible said, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. That ain't too popular nowadays. Nowadays, when you come to church, I'm supposed to make you feel good about yourself. Well, I hate to tell you, but the Bible don't always do that. The Bible says, get it right, then we'll feel good, amen? We'll feel good after we get it right, but you gotta get it right first. Now, look here what he said. Verse seven, uh, six, they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters their sons and served their God. They got in with this mixed multitude, and it turned into a big mess. Set up their image 
uh, uh, they, they took their daughters to be their wives. Uh, a lot of times, that's that thing in the, in the New Testament that says, be not unequally gathered gather with unbelievers. That's where we get that you should not marry somebody who's not saved. Now, a lot of times, a man will hardly ever marry a woman who's not saved. A Christian man almost always will marry a Christian woman. Almost always. But a Christian woman will marry a, a lost man. I don't know why. They get talked into it. They think they ain't never going to have another chance. I don't know what the problem is. I think they think, well, I love him and he loves me and he'll change. After, and he changes all right. He gets worse. He gets worse nine times out of ten. If he ain't no count before you marry him, he ain't no count after you marry him most of the time, unless God gets a hold of him. I hate to say that, but truth is truth, and you get in trouble when you won't listen to truth. There's a lot of women wish to God they had waited on the Lord because I'd rather be an old maid than to wish I was. One man said, I'd rather be an old maid and look for a man all day than to get married and look for him all night. There's a lot of them done that, ain't they? But usually a woman will take a man that ain't right with God, but a man won't take a woman that ain't right with God. I don't, I don't know why that is, but the South, North and South Carolina and Georgia, Kentucky, Mississippi and Tennessee and Alabama and Florida are full of women, churches of women who go to church and their husbands at home or, and won't come to church. And I like, just, I, I mean, I've been preaching 40 years and I've, I've seen it. Hundreds of churches where it's two thirds women. Where's the husband? He ain't saved. Pray for my husband. He ain't saved. It's never the other way around. They took their daughters to be their wives uh, or gave them their daughters to be their wives. And they served Balaam. And the anger of the Lord, verse 8, was kindled, was hot against them. Here they go again. Sold them into the hand of Shushan Ristham, whoever that fellow is, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Shushan Ristham eight years. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. The Lord raised up a deliverer of them, Israel, who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. Now watch that happen over and over and over. They serve God. He blesses them. Then they get backslid. He sends the enemy and wham! Burns their houses down, kills their kids, everything. They serve God. Get right. They send them a judge to deliver them. Verse 10, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Shushan, Rishaim, whoever that fellow is, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. See, they won the victory. And they prevailed. Now look at verse 11. This is your life and my life. And the land had rest 40 years. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. They had a big revival, got right with God, killed that old mean king, and had rest 40 years. Smooth sailing, brother, for all them years. Ain't that a blessing? Wouldn't you like some smooth sailing in your life? i tell you how you can have it. Get right with God. Get right with God. Now, that don't mean you're never going to have a battle, but i tell you one thing. Things are a lot smoother when you're right with God. It's a blessing, it's a blessing to lay down at night and not have a guilty conscience or be scared to death or afraid the phone's going to ring or afraid, you, afraid the, the cops are going to get you or you're going to get thrown in jail. It's a blessing to have smooth sailing and the blessings of God. You know, they say a clear conscience is the softest pillow. And buddy, your heart's right with God. You, when you lay down at night and you know everything's right with God, I'm telling you, there ain't nothing in the world like that. I told, who did I tell that to the other day? I forgot. Uh, um, we was talking to somebody. I was witnessing somebody. It was on bus route, I think. And you know what I told these two ladies? I said, you know what? The best feeling in the world is to lay down at night and know things are right with you and the Lord, your Creator. Ain't no feeling like that. There's no greater blessing than that. They had rest 11 years. Now, here we go in the book of Judges. This could be a movie. Look at this story. Here goes one of them wild ones. Verse number 12. And the children of Israel did evil again. Here they go again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel. So there's God letting your enemies get strong and overcome you. Because you won't get right. 
Did you know that, look here, when, when, when I, my kids were little, I whipped them with a belt sometimes. I didn't always. You're supposed to use a hickory switch, but they used a belt on me when I was little, and it didn't get given. Some of y'all, you, there's nothing wrong with that. The Bible teaches a switch, but I had a belt. I said, I got a belt right here. I'll use it on you. I'll, I'll hit you with this belt, you know. Pow, right there where the Lord provided a little place where you won't break no bones, and it's good for them. And you know what? The kings, these false kings, are God's belt. People are God's belt. So when you go out here and you do something wrong, and then you get in a fight at work, you know what that man is? That's God's belt. He uses people to spank you. He sure does. I can prove it. I can prove it. Uh, let me see if I can find that scripture here. I'll show it to you. Uh, uh, he, he um, let's see, I had it wrote down back here. Oh, let's see here. I hope I can find it. If I can't, I promise you. I, there you go. Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 7. Back up to first, oh, on over to 1 Samuel 7 and look at verse 14. 1 Samuel, over to your right. Chapter 7 and verse 14. Funny how everybody picks out the good, smooth parts of the Bible they like and not the parts they don't like. Somebody said, there ain't no way hell could be forever. People ain't that bad. You could turn right around and say, there's no way heaven could be forever. Nobody's good enough to deserve that. See what I mean? You can't do it like that. You can't, it all stands or falls, whether it's true or not. All right, look at verse number... uh, uh, chapter 7, did I say 7? I'm wrong somehow. Uh, hmm? Let me look at 4 today. It says, uh, all right, no, I'm wrong. Sorry, got it wrote down wrong here somewhere. Second Samuel seven fourteen. sorry. Thank you there, sister. She corrects me when I'm wrong and loves it. Now, there you go. Second, thank you. Second Samuel 7, 14. Look at here. Now, look at this. This is your Bible. Ain't many people even knows this is in the Bible. I will be his father and he'll be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. The Lord said, I'll take men and whip you with them. There ain't no doubt in my mind. Look, you know God could have stopped that attack on us on 9-11. He could have stopped that, right? But he didn't. He he could have stopped diseases from coming, but he don't. He lets them come because we won't do right. That's right. That's exactly right. All right, now back to Judges. He uses men to whip you sometimes. Back to Judges. This is one of the weird stories in the book of Judges. This ought to be in a movie. Uh, Chapter 3 and verse 13. Eglon was a wicked king, and he has beaten Israel up, and God used him to beat Israel. Verse 13, and he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek. Who's Amalek in the Bible? A type of the flesh. See? And they went and smote Israel. The flesh got the victory. Can you read that? Or you're a New Testament Christian. Look at it. And possessed the city of palm trees. So the children of Israel served Eglon, children of Moab, 18 years they stayed backslid. But when they cried unto the Lord, verse 15, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, king of Moab. All right, stop right there. So they raise up this judge, and he's a left-handed man. Why does God say that? We're going to do a little study on being left-handed. What the Bible said, very brief, because the Bible says a whole lot about it. Left-handed, right-handed, no-handed, both-handed. Okay? Now, let's finish reading this story and come back. This, this is one I preach on when lefty let fatty have it. Some of y'all remember that message a long time ago. Famous message, when lefty let fatty have it. If you've never heard that message, you need to hear it. Uh, don't get mad at me, I'm using Bible language. Don't get mad at me for using Bible language. I'm not making fun of nobody. It's wrong to make fun of anybody, and I'm not. I'm, I'm preaching the Bible. Look here at verse number um, 16. But Ehud made him a dagger which had two-edged, a two-edged sword. 
of a cubic length, that's at least 18 inches, probably more. And he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. All right, hold it there. He's got this 18-inch dagger right here on his right thigh, and he's left-handed. That way he can reach over here and go whoosh, like that. So like if he's right-handed man, reach over here and grab it. Okay, all right, let's finish reading. Look at this story. And he brought the present, whatever that was, box of candy, cake, to Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. That's offensive today. So you can jump in the lake for what you can do if you're offended by that. That's not making fun of anybody. That's the only way to describe that person. The Bible said he was a very fat man. Some people are very skinny. When you say there's a skinny man, there's a man with glasses, there's a man with a broke arm, you're not making fun of him. Now, you shouldn't make fun of nobody, right? For their size or their shape or their color or whatever. That's wrong. It's just describe. You can't even describe nobody. Oh, there's a tall man. <gasps> You know, uh, there's a short, oh, you're making fun of short people. Just shut up. Uh, you know, you can't open your mouth nowadays without somebody being offended. And you shouldn't make fun of people. I'm all against that. I'm against making fun of people. It's just, describe, how you going? Oh, that, that great big tall redhead woman. That little short blonde headed woman. That's not making fun of nobody. You can't make, you can't open your mouth nowadays without somebody being offended. Every time somebody says, I'm going to start getting offended at these old jokes. I'll sue you if you make an old joke. Uh, you need to be able, you have a little more self-confidence in that. Uh, anyway, verse 17. And he brought the president to Eglon, and Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. But he himself turned again from the queries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, Keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him. And Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in the summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. <whistles> Isn't that something? And he arose out of his seat. And Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the haft, that's a handle, also went in after the blade and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly and the dirt came out. <laughs> Whew, there's your real, that's a movie there, buddy. He stuck that so far in that, in that guy's body that the hand, his hand and the haft went into the fat and the fat closed up on that thing, and dirt came out. About that. That thing was 18 inches long, and it probably didn't even go all the way through that guy. Come out to his back, now 18 inch knife would go through me, that's for sure. But it, it just hit his backbone, it, the, it was stuck all the way in him, like that. Bam! And left it in there like that. What a story. What a story. I wonder why Joel Osteen hadn't preached on that lately. Because you pick out what parts of the Bible that builds a big church that makes people feel good about themselves and leave the rest of it out. That's why. <laughs> that, that wouldn't go over too good his place. It ain't going over too good here, but you'll get over it. Uh, uh, that's my, my job. You, you want me to leave it out. He said, I got a message from God unto thee, brother. And it said the dirt came out. I mean, can you imagine that knife? Where's my knife? I pulled my hand back, my knife disappeared. It's like that big old guy one time, don't get mad at me. He said uh, that he went to the doctor and they, they, they pulled up like that and examined him and the remote control fell out. Uh, that's bad. And they wondered how come every time he rolled over, the TV channel changed. He shouldn't do that. I'm just kidding. But anyway, uh, uh, he, had, he, he, he went like a wham, and his knife disappeared, and the handle disappeared. And he said, oh, my goodness. And he took off running out the door, verse 23, and Ehud went forth the porch and shut the doors behind him and locked them. Man, it's getting good now. Hollywood can't make no movie like this, verse 24. And when he was gone out, the servants came. 
And they saw that, behold, the doors, the parlor were locked. He's in there in that summer parlor, you know, where they drop grapes in your mouth and turn the ceiling and fan on you, and he's relaxing. And they said, he just covered his feet in the summer chamber. He's taking a nap. And they tarried till they were ashamed. And behold, he opened up the door and never did open it, never did open it. And they took a key. Somebody had an extra key and they went and got it and opened it. And the Lord was falling down dead on the earth. And Ehud escaped while they tarried and passed beyond the quarries, rock quarries, and escaped to Syria. And it came to pass when he was come that he blew a trumpet in the mount of Ephraim and the children of Israel went down with him from the mountain before them, and he said unto them, Follow after me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. And they went down after him and took the fords of Jordan for, toward Moab and suffered not a man to pass over. Stop right there. Let's go back over this story just a minute. About five minutes on this story here. What a story, y'all. Let's make a movie out of that. Man, I want to see a reality show. Here's Lefty, old, old, old uh, Eglon. And here's Ehud. And uh, old Eglon comes in there. The, he was the king of Moab, and he was mean. And he sat over here in his parlor, and he said, Go kill him. 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 And, and he, he's, a, he's a big man, big heavy man. And one day God raised him up a delivery, and he said, You know what? My children's praying. I believe I'll just touch somebody. And he put his hand on this old left-handed boy. Now, the Bible talks some stuff about left-handed. The Bible talks favorably about right-handed oh, a hundred times. Being right-handed is spoken of more favorably because Jesus is pictured as sitting at the right hand of God. Now, they, they say that 90% of the people in the world are right-handed. Around 10 to 12 percent, I don't know how they figured it out, maybe uh, that's what they say, are left handed, and only 1 percent are both handed or neither handed. And I think, um, ain't that what you are, Brother Mike? Ain't you both handed? He's both handed? That would be cool. I wish I was. Uh, but they, they say that it's got something to do with, you know, you've heard. The left side of your brain controls your right side, and the right side of your brain controls the left side. So left-handed people are the only ones in their right mind. Uh, but it's got something to do with the way your brain's constructed, but there are some people that can do stuff just as good one hand can another. Now, um, I don't know why the Lord did that. I have no idea. I have no idea. I mean, you could probably study it out. I think there's a 100 references to being to favorably to being right-handed in the Bible, but then you got them guys that could take them stones and not miss 700 of them that could hit that clock back yonder at, uh, with, a, with a sling and a rock. And then here's this guy, got a message from God, a picture of the Word of God, and kills the enemies of the Lord with it. Um, I know that, you know, you heard that uh, uh, two little kids sat down one time and one of them, and they looked at the sunset, and Mom, he said, Mama, look at that beautiful sunset. Wow, all them colors, and just think, God did that with his left hand. And she said, Honey, why do you say that? She said, God did all of that with his left hand. She said, Why do you say that? She said, Because Jesus is sitting on his right hand. And that, she they didn't understand, understand, you know, what that scripture meant. But, but uh, the, I don't understand what it means either. But I know, I know, uh, I know I'm right-handed. I think one of Carrie's kids. See, Todd's left-handed, and one of Carrie's kids is both-handed, ain't it, Kelly? Seems like one of them throws a ball with one hand each with the other, or something like that. Jared does it. Yeah, one of yours, one of y'all's is right. One of them. Is that right? He throws a football left-handed and a baseball right-handed. How does he bat? He bats left-handed. Hey, you bat right-handed, don't you, Mike? You bat left-handed. What do you do right-handed? You write with your right hand. But he, he plays, he shoots with his left hand. Ain't that something? And you can't tell no difference? Ain't that something? That's wild, isn't it? 
Yeah. Do what, Brother Eric? Sheep and the goats, yeah. Ain't that something? There's nothing wrong. <laughs> you know, so this man here was a great man. And notice what he said here. The Bible said he had this dagger with two edges. Now, folks, to me, this might mean not mean much to you, but to me, stuff like this proves the Bible's true. There's no way in the world the writer of Judges thousands of years ago could have known that there was even going to be a Bible. They didn't even know there was even going to be a Bible when this happened. And it said he had a message from God and it was a two-edged sword. A two-edged sword, that's a message from God. Now come on, Hebrews 4, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, the word of God. Quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And, and listen, you know what the Bible says? Cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. You know what you need to use on bus route? You know what you need to use at work? Your sword, buddy. Your sword. He took care. He said, I have a message from God unto thee, boy. Ooh! You know, uh, and, and there he went. Now, that's what you do with the Bible. Don't draw blood, brother. Draw blood. If, see, if, you're, if, if, uh, if somebody's at work, you know, and they're shacking up, uh, uh, they, marriage is honor and all, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Ooh! You come to church and hear that, and you're shacking up, it'll get you right in the gut. If you're, a, if you're a homosexual and you come to church and the preacher gets up, takes a sword, the dagger, and it says, men with men working that which is unseemly, burning their lust toward one another, ooh, see? And that's why people say they don't like to come to church. They get stuck. The two-edged sword will stick you. It'll stick you. You say, does it ever stick you? Yes, sir, all the time. I get stuck. You get stuck. It's a double-edged sword. And that's, like I said, that's one way I know the Bible's true, y'all. They couldn't have known that. They couldn't. Whoever wrote Judges, he said, I have a message from God unto thee. Why didn't he say, I've come here to kill you? He had, I have a message from God. He sure did. Here's your message. Ooh, you got it. Uh, and, and, and that's an amazing story. That's an amazing story. That just, it just, to me, that's just unbelievable. Uh, uh, wow, wow. A dagger with two edges. The, the writer had no idea that was going to be a picture of the word of God. Jeremiah 48, 10 said, Cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. And the dirt came out. Did, have you ever heard that story uh, 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 that like if you, if you can get cut in here somewhere, the actual out of your intestines and stuff, dirt literally is in there? You, anybody ever heard that? True. I look at it like this. When the word of God's preached, the dirt comes out. I've been in churches and preached before, and when I got through, the dirt came out, buddy. People stood up and started confessing. The dirt came out. I've preached before, and people get up and said, I've been drinking liquor, and I'm sorry, and I want everybody to forgive me. The dirt came out. Ain't that crazy? Ain't that, that's, that's amazing. When I read the Bible, it jumps in me like it. it just starts jumping all in me and over me. I think, good night, that's 4,000 years ago. And they nailed it, nailed it. The dirt came out. Use that two-edged sword, the dirt will come out. You know, them Hollywood tabloids, that's the dirt right there. The dirt, they said the dirt, it came out about so-and-so. It came out. Oh, so-and-so was a hypocrite, and it came out. Donald Trump colluded with Russia, and it came out. Which they, they, That's just bunch of junk. I reckon, I don't know, uh, if he did or he didn't, it'll, it'll come out one day. It'll come out. Whatever you've done, it'll come out. The dirt came out. Now, let's finish this up here. Now, I'm sorry to jump around, but I'm gonna, I got two minutes and I'm going to finish this. Verse 29, and they slew of Moab, they killed all them wicked men, 10,000 men. See, are you looking at verse 29? All lusty, all men of valor, and they escaped not one. They killed 10,000 thousand lusty men that's the only time that word's in the Bible lusty anybody know what it means it can mean strong healthy vigorant and in the strong's concordance the Hebrew definition of that word lusty is greasy fat and plenteous rich Michael Moore. Uh, 
Donald Trump. <laughs> Greasy, fat, rich. Uh, uh, I mean, that's what it means. Lusty. It don't mean lusty like Brad Pitt, you know, or there's, you know, Justin Timberlake or somebody. It means over, it means strength, shack, uh, somebody like that. Uh, overfed, overgrown, overfed, greasy brat. Amen. Now let's look at verse 30. Moab subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest 80 years. They went 80 years this time and had a big revival. And then this guy Shamgar comes up. Son of Anath, we slew the Philistines, 600 men with an ox goad. There's your story. He killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad, and he delivered Israel. Now, that's a whole other story. That's another chapter in the book, another segment in the movie, Shamgar. Now, why did he have an ox goad? An ox goad was six to eight feet long, about that big around, like a pole, and they'd use it to goad them oxes, and he took that thing and killed 600 men with it. Now, the reason he had an ox goad, why didn't he have a sword or a spear? Because back yonder over in 1 Samuel, I believe it was, it said them Philistines took their weapons, and it wouldn't let them make weapons, so he took an ox goad and killed 600 of them. Somebody have a question? Jawbone now, yep. And we're coming to Samson pretty soon. Ain't that something? That Bible's something else, ain't it? All right. It's, it's a big pole <laughs> to goad them, to stick them oxen when they're trying to go over this way, gouge them and push them into, into the pen or in the gate or wherever you're going with them. All right. Correct me, anybody. Help me out. Straighten me out if I'm wrong. All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, it never, ever ceases to amaze us, to impress us, to challenge us, to convict us, to feed us, and to strengthen us. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thy word is truth. Thank you, Lord, that it don't hold nothing back, tells the truth as it is to men as they are. We thank you for this story here in the book of Judges tonight. Help us to learn from it, to get the truth of it, and to apply it in our lives like we should. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, now get you some of these.